I have hit the button. We need to wait some minutes, seconds. Here we are. Okay. Good. Well, we are live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, Toronto. Um, well, we are here today. It's our isolation, uh, as every Wednesday. And we have today a very special guest. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about what's Weisolation. We started uh, Weisolation because we wanted to have a space uh, where we could all share with our skills during um, the isolation period of coronavirus. And we felt that it was a huge opportunity, a very nice opportunity to don't feel alone. So an opportunity to meet more people, to connect with other folks that had sustainability in their minds. And why not just learning new skills? Um, yes. So, ah, oh. <laughs> hello, Lynn. Hello. Sorry, I'm a little bit late today. <laughs> I think it's today lovely. was a good day. <laughs> it's good. And hello, Ryan. Nice to e-meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> All right, sorry, I'll let you continue with your intro. Yeah, well, first, I think uh, before I forget, I'm gonna do the land acknowledgement. Um, and uh, I want to do a special land acknowledgement today because of all the situation we are all, all in and what the world is talking about and the hot topic um around um and it's just a special land acknowledgement about uh thinking about the history of the world and not just our country but uh, uh history of humanity and how colonization has affected us um until today and we don't even realize the systematic um uh, systematic biases, systematic, uh, someone calls them privileges, so uh, I, I like to call them just like blindness. Um, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, in Canada we, we are living in, uh, I'm gonna want to go here. I don't want to make a mistake on that. I just want to acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, uh, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anish Nakbeg, and Chipiwa. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. All the Nosone and Wendat peoples. And now it's uh, home to many diverse First Nations in its and met these people. And I would say that nothing of this will make sense if we don't start uh, acknowledging people. Like we should start actually from acknowledging people rather than acknowledging just the land and the ownership and the history. So what I'm, I want to place a question today to everyone. Um, is that uh, this belief that uh, black people, people of color, indigenous people, poor people, uh, the land uh, don't, don't matter. Uh, this is not a new topic, uh, but I will say that I want to, to, to place a question about what are we going to do with all of this? with that, this information. Um, how we as society, are we go how are we going to create a new path uh, for the future? And uh, so I want to let you with a couple of questions. 
on uh, some exercises. <laughs> uh, that the first one is to ask yourself, is my circle diverse? Do I have people that are different around me? Um, also asking yourself, what do I really believe? Uh, what do I feel and think when I see someone that is different to me? And really pay attention to those thoughts. And the next, next question is, ask yourself, why do you think or feel that? And um, so this question is just to try to change the narrative and to try to change uh, our own biases because we all have them and it's fine, but it's not fine to keep, keep them in our mind. And I also want to uh, share a um, nice documentary uh, about First Nation issues that I like it a lot. I'm gonna place it on the comments uh, afterwards. Uh, here, one second. It's the Canis Satake, 270 years of resistance by Alanis Obon Sawin. And uh, voila. <laughs> um, we have today with us Ryan from Free Geek Toronto and Lynn from Plastic Free Toronto. Uh, let's uh, let Brian share with us a little bit more about Free Geek Toronto. What do you guys are doing? <laughs> sure. Um so uh, Free Geek Toronto has been around for about uh, 10 years now. Um, it started off as a completely volunteer run organization and it's slowly we've been um, trying to do more and that's let us become uh, a not-for-profit uh, social enterprise. And our focus is on, is, is on reusing technology. Um, that primarily kind of revolves around like computing devices. So like your laptops and your desktops and some of the things that the peripheries that go with it. But we also try and we try and reuse as much as possible. So our focus is on reuse first and then recycle. Um, and we also are trying to make sure, make the uh, idea around reusing technology or extending the life of our, our devices uh, something that's more uh, normalized and, comf and comfortable. Um, how successful we are at it is you know remains to be seen. But we try we try our best and we do we do as much good as we can. Um, and yeah, that's, and so today we're just going to kind of talk about a bunch of different things, I think, and uh, I'll try and give you as much as I know, um, but I am the first one to acknowledge that I don't know everything. So if I don't know the answer to something, I will say, I don't know, and uh, probably something I'm going to, you know, spend five hours afterwards looking at kind of research on and good questions. And, and that's amazing, Ryan, because we don't need to know everything. Yeah. Uh, but we need to be open to learn and to educate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, it, you know, to start the conversation, if we want to really kind of break off anything, like people are like, okay, my computer's running slowly, or if I have an old computer, what's the thing I should do? Uh, the, honestly, the first thing I always tell people is clean it. Literally clean it. Dust and dirt are the two most, uh, they, they, they capture heat. And so, and heat, when your computer gets hot, it it automatically reduces at what it does. It speeds and stuff like that to not overheat and destroy itself. It's a self-preservation thing. So your computer is running slowly. That means it's actually running properly because it's, if it's overheating, it's trying to slow itself down. And the best way, there, there's a couple of ways you can kind of deal with that. Um, one thing you don't want to do is no, don't blow with your mouth because you have, you know, as we now know because of COVID, thousands and thousands of droplets of, of moisture in your mouth and it's not good. Um, you could use something as simple as a clean uh, makeup brush because the makeup uh -huh. brushes are really good because they're nice and light so you're not going to do a lot of damage or if you already have it I wouldn't go out and buy it if you don't um, a can of compressed air um, but you got to be careful with compressed air because um, if it's too cold on something that's hot it could crack it but it's a it's another way of getting into some of those hard to reach places so I always tell people that you know if nothing else you know you open it up and you try and clean it out that's the best way 
doing well, that is um, difficult and but you know that's the first for thing. me for me when i hear open it up uh, i get a stress <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting because if this was, you know, 20 years ago and most of us had desktops, I would be like, oh, don't worry about it. A desktop, it's like two screws and you open it up and then everything is, there's lots of space and the likelihood of breaking something goes down dramatically. But now as we're using more phones and laptops and the laptops are getting thinner and thinner and thinner, it yeah. actually does become more and more uh, difficult to try and clean it out. And so um, the... I don't, there's no, there's no easy way to say this, that basically um, a lot of laptops you get this way, the way they make them so thin is that they, they take out the screws and they add more uh, glue into it. Oh. And if you open it up and you don't replace the glue, you've got a broken computer. So you have to kind of do your research before you open it up. Like you say, I agree with you that if you're worried about something, the worst thing you can do is just go in with a screwdriver and just start trying to take stuff out. <laughs> the, easiest way, the easiest way to do it is that most most companies, most good companies uh, will give you like an, will, will have like a, 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 like an owner's manual or some kind of manual online. And the directions in some of them are not awesome. They're like, they're good. Like they're the best directions because they're the ones coming from the manufacturer. So they, they'll catch everything. But, you know, we are on YouTube. There are thousands of YouTube videos. If you have the manual plus a YouTube video, the amount that you can get done is, is quite surprising. And you can kind of learn about like the kind of chicks and trips because like, you know, like there might be little clips or things like that. Um, the one thing I wouldn't recommend, though, is you shouldn't try and open up your phone. Um, phones are air are sealed tightly, and if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna it, it, the likelihood of breaking something because everything's so fragile and so small, it goes up like dramatically. And so, um, you know, laptops, desktops, yeah, but you really have it's like unfortunate thing is you have to do some research on it. So you kind of want to get to the point where you don't get where you have to open it up. And so, you know, um, as much as we love to uh, try to avoid eating over your computer. Little Oops. blue crumbs going into your <laughs> into your into your uh, keyboard is important. Um, I think we all know not to drink liquids around it, um, especially liquids with uh, any type of sh sugar in it, um, because yeah. water will just evaporate. And it might leave something behind and it might still cause a problem, but sugar remains behind and can act as a, a way to short circuit the cir the, co the computers. <gasps> so you have to be oh. kind of mindful of that. And that's why that's why like you know. Um, that's the point but like that's why you can drop your phone in the uh the toilet or the thing because and pull it out and just put in a bag of rice but if you do the same thing with your computer your computer is not air is not um sealed up because of the vents and stuff like that so yeah is it because of the keyboard like the keyboard below i can kind of see yeah. so um hmm, i don't have another oh wait i do <laughs> this is one of the advantages to work in a computer shop. You have, you have many computers. <laughs> this is an old I, uh, I, I Mac Air that I use um, sometimes. So when you open up the computer, the the computer, like all the computing stuff, is right underneath the keyboard, and the keyboards are never like they'll have like a, they might have like a liquid shield and stuff like that, but it's not a hundred percent. And over time, anything degrades, and so the little keys, when they can go in, the water can get through, and so that's why it's really important. And there's especially with something like this, where there's no um, fans or anything for the water to come out, it just sits in there. And yes. so that's, we gotta be kind of, you gotta be kind of careful with it. I have like another computer over there I could probably pull out. You know, maybe this goes long, I can grab my desktop and open it up for us later too. But the idea is that like, you wanna, the best way to do it is to be, is to do pre is preventative measures. So the other thing I always like to tell people, again, this is around the heat idea is, uh, can't do this, but like a show of hands of the people on the Zoom call here. How many people have taken their computer into like bed with them or like curled up in a blanket with it? Right? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Come on. Yes. So blankets are so great because they're nice and comfy and squishy and stuff like that. Computers hate it because they need airflow, right? And a blanket will just cover all those lovely airports, all those places where the hot air's got to push out and it just kind of closes it up. And so it can cause your computer to overheat. So it could slow down again. So, and then also, if it's not right, some of the little fibers might go into it. That's less of a risk, to be honest, because it's put it's in air, it's pushing air out. But it does do that. So the simple solution to that is like literally get a book, get like a hard book, put it underneath it. It's got a flat surface now. Your 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 uh, your blanket won't go around as much. And it's like, now again, these are fairly practical solutions. I'm sure if if some technician came on and heard me talking about this they might be like well actually and stuff like this but rea the reality is it's just got to be aware that the two things that computers like the least is heat 
and liquids. Liquids. And so, <laughs> if you stay away from both of those, your your likelihood of of, of running of us running to an issue is more. Is, is and I think uh, I think it's very difficult uh, for us to make this separation because uh, I mean we are very busy and uh, we are like even eating having lunch next to our laptop every day. <laughs> I mean, like, I've tried to talk to people about like, maybe it could be a mindful moment to like, kind of just like, if you're trying to think about, hey, I'm trying to extend the life of my, my devices. If I take a moment to just pause and eat separately, it means I'm not looking at the screen while I'm doing it. I can focus on the food and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting at, you know, my desk eating my lunch, but my lunch is over here and I'm trying to do it. <laughs> You know, trying to be away from it as much as possible and you know it's it's all about it's all about doing as much as you can because the thing is is that the harder your computer has to work or your device has to work the more the more stress you're putting on it and the more you know like like anything it, it starts to it'll wear it down even more and so you, you the more you can do to kind of prevent that the better off you are right and also i guess uh, you are extending its life uh... i mean it the, like you know it, it Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can, you can extend it, but then at a certain point it's it like computers start to, you know, they age. Now, the one thing that we have noticed recently is that um, the age of a, of a computer, especially maybe not a phone, but like of a computer, a laptop or desktop, the length of time that it's still usable has been slowly growing a bit, especially if you're not doing as many uh, hot, like, um, heavy things that require intense workloads. You know, someone might disagree with me, but you know, like there are people who are still using 10 or 12 year old computers to do everyday activities because uh, the web browsers, while, while a web browser, well, we do most of our stuff on the web now, and while web browsers have become more complex and stuff like that, they're still not super lab, uh, you know, labor intensive or resource intensive on your computer. So if you're doing a lot of things on your, comp like, you know, if you're just doing email or things like that, your computer can last a little bit longer with, you know, just doing, just, you know, being nice to it. Um, and some, unfortunately, some of the, the, some of the things that are like the, the true be nice to things to keep it going, um, require a little bit more, um, a little bit more like skill, but it's not, I want to, I want to say that it's not so much. Um, it's just that you have to kind of spend, it is something you can just spend a little bit more time researching and like, like everything else, if everyone's so busy, you've got other things to do, maybe you can't do that. Maybe that's a little bit more of a challenge, but it, you know, if it is like, it's the kind of thing, like it's like a, it could be an afternoon project it's not like it doesn't have to be labor it doesn't have to be super labor intensive it can just be a small project you know? okay oh you're on mute thank you very much <laughs> a big question i'm always thinking about turning off my laptop every evening and yeah. even when i will love because i know that it will save carbon emissions and ed electricity and uh, I don't even know if the life of my laptop. Uh, I opened so many windows, and at the end of the, the the day, I'm lazy to to save everything that I have because mm -hmm. I feel it important. Is really like <laughs> it's okay. So there's mixed. There's, <laughs> Okay, I can give you two. I can give I you two. Get well. <laughs> yeah. I can give you two quick. I can give you like two quick things, and I'm not like again. Computers are changing, and and software is getting smarter and smarter. So it's trying to predict that people are doing this more and more. That people just kind of close the the laptop thing without going through the whole turn off situation. So um, they're getting the computers are getting better at resource management, and that's the key thing here. Um, one thing you will notice though, if you do, if you have like 20 tabs open and you keep your computer open for five days without turning it off, all of that stuff stays in your, in your RAM, which is the short-term memory of the computer. And that's not a big deal. You know, like you need it to like kind of run your thing and, and it's fine to keep it going. But if you know, so if you're not noticing any problems with it, then you're okay. But there are some people who may find that, you know, um, as operating systems get more complex, they take up more and more of the RAM. And then if you also have all the browsers open, you're gonna, it's gonna take up more and more of the RAM. And so suddenly your res resources, where two years ago it was okay, if they just go up by like 5% each, suddenly maybe you're, that buffer of like 10, 15% you had is gone. And so you're just gonna start seeing things getting slower and slower. So when you turn things off, what the computer does, you know, the, there's the 
anyone's ever seen that uh, show or the IQ crowd, it's on Netflix. It's fantastic. It's British. Really recommend it. Um, the first thing they always say is you try turning it on and off again. And it's no joke. That is like what it does is when you turn it off, it turns off, it ends all of the processes. So if there was a corrupt process in your computer, it turns it off. And then when it turns it back on, it reboots it with a new process. And so then suddenly, if there was an issue with it, just turning it on and off again properly could actually fix the problem. Um, it's surprising how, like, I'll be very honest with you right now. My trackpad stopped working like five minutes before I do this presentation. I have a little nub thing on it, so I'm okay. But as, if I had more time, I would just turn the computer on and off again because that w it, it was something, I hit a wrong button in some sequence and I don't want to go back and try to find it. So if I just turn it off, turn it back, it goes back to its original settings and we're good to go. But yeah, having multiple brow like tabs open, especially in some uh, certain browsers that take up a little bit more space and real estate in your resources, um, could really lead to your computer going slowly. And again, overtaxing your computer, your processors adds more wear. It doesn't extend the life of the computer as much. So I have a question we, about yeah. RAM. Mm -hmm. How do we know how much is being used at any given time? Like, how do we know if we're like overloading our computer with too much stuff? Other than that, like we might see it slowing down. Like, is there a way to see like what? Yep. Yep. If you got a Windows yep. machine, you hit Alt, Control, Delete, and you go to something called Taskmaster, ta Task Manager, Task Manager, sorry, Task Manager. And then you can get a nice flow of all of the processes, how much load your CPU is, how much your RAM is using, how much disk, how much like disk speed, how much disk space you're using at one given time, and stuff like that. It's a really, it's a really helpful one. There's a similar tool for Mac, but I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, you can check it on your phone too. You can see how much RAM you're using on your phone. Your Android one, it's just in the, it's in the, it's in the settings. IOS doesn't let you do that, I don't think. Uh, you know, I'm going to say that, and then, of course, someone's going to find this later and tell me that it does exist. But I don't know off the top of my head where it is. But it probably does. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty handy feature that um, all these computers have. Um, I have, I, can't sh I, I had to delete it. Uh, usually, I'm running a, a Linux computer, and I usually have, like, a, a whole graphic on my desktop that just shows me what the processes are. I just keep it up there because I think it looks cool. I've looked at that processes thing before and like sometimes it's really obvious it's like Google Chrome or Firefox but then I swear there's like a million processes going on in the back and I'm like I have no idea what this is and like if I shut it down is that a bad thing <laughs> and that's and you're right that's and that's the thing like there are so many pro there th what that is listing it's listing every process that your operating system is trying to use to keep it going and like so each little thing you see on your operating system is actually technically a little small uh, utility or program that's running and you're not, you're not, you're right. You don't know which ones need to be running in the background and which ones don't. Um, there was a bug in Windows 10 for a while where the notification system was eating up, was just like, it just would keep climbing and would take up all the resources. So you just have to figure out which one that was and delete and stop that one. And it suddenly people's computers were running fine. And it, you know, there might be more elegant solutions, but you know, you're, it's surprising, like it, 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 there is a there is a skill to being able to Google what what's going on with your computer, and it's a skill that a lot of the people who come in to volunteer or work at Free Geek get really good at because we don't no one knows the answers and like you know if you can spend an hour kind of going through forums or looking for websites that you you know you know about that are good you can kind of you know get something out of it. So. Can I ask another question? Sure. Go ahead. What can people bring their computer in for at Free Geek? Is it just like if like is it is there like a repair slash diagnostic mm -hmm. component to free keep, or is it just like when you're done with your tech, you bring it there and then it gets repurposed? So we've been primarily focusing on that that second part. The when you're done with it, bring it to us and we'll try and get reuse out of it. Just because um, it, we're we're really small, like we're a really small organization. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, on average, you know, it's like you know less like five or six staff members, some part time, some full time and about, you know, maybe 20 or so volunteers who come, some come in regularly, some are more infrequent. So we don't have like the capacity to be able to offer anything up. We don't, I will say that we try our best to help, but like we can't, we don't, we're not a, we're not a repair shop. And so we're trying to do things like this where we go out and help. We're trying to, you know, uh, when people come to us, we say, hey, you know, the repair cafe, that's, that's what their bread and butter is. They go around, you know, and do the the pop-ups at all the at all the libraries and stuff like that and you know kind of search them out and, thing, and, and do things like that and then we do you know we're, we're always looking for you know um responsible and uh you know um, good repair shops across the city who we can recommend um you know 
and, and kind of go go that route to kind of give you know voice to other businesses as well um but you know that's not to say like when someone comes in with a question we're gonna we say no but you know sometimes it's like a, it's like a, if you say hey i got this problem we might be like that's gonna be a lot of money you know like if the computer won't turn on and it's really not an obvious question uh, not an obvious answer um you know you might just be like you're better off not trying to do anything and just take it to a repair person because if we try to do something and it makes it worse then the, suddenly the costs with the repair can go up exponentially right and so it's kind of it's that's kind of the catch-22 with like kind of repair um the one thing you can um always we always recommend that people do though is try and back up your data any important information you have back it up whether it's if you're comfortable with using a uh, online service use that if you need a usb stick and just throw everything on there um or even if honestly it's like you, you got your pictures on your phone and your pictures on your computer like that's that's backing it up right like it's it's really all about just making sure because you know your your computer and your programs you can replace but like pictures and documents those are irreplaceable irreplaceable and, and data recovery is it's come a long way but it's still not um it's not 100 percent. and so if your if a computer fails um which at some point they probably all will um you need to be prepared for that eventuality um and i'm not talking about some like elaborate thing like just you know just try and try and do your best right like it's one thing to lose a month's worth of, of pictures because you forgot to up uh you know do a backup once but it's um it's another thing to lose like you know 10 years worth right yeah i know that from per personal experience so i have a question yeah <laughs> uh you mentioned be, uh, earlier when you were introducing a uh, free gig mm -hmm. that you you are Mm, preferring to do reusing uh, over recycling. Yeah. And I just want uh, uh, for other folks out there that doesn't really understand why, if you can share with us why. Oh, um, well, okay. Do you want the cynical answer or do you want like the more like philosophical, like, you know, like nice feeling? Philosophical. Well, I like the philosophy. Well, okay. both of them. <laughs> okay. So um, the the amount of energy that it takes to recycle uh, technology is enormous. It's not as much as doing uh, as like creating a new computer from virgin materials, but it is like it's it's a significant amount. And when you pull something out for reuse before it goes through that cycle, that means that that's one. Th there's two things about it. That's one thing. That, that's a piece that doesn't need to be replaced by a, a new a new item. Um, and secondly, it's. Uh, it's not it there's so much so many computers that there's a minor issue with but because people don't know how to fix it or think it's going to be too much money they just toss it aside they they, they recycle it and then uh, or you know they'll get rid of it and get a, and pick up a new one and there's again i'm not trying to like it's not that sometimes you need a new computer like realistically there are some tasks and some work that people have out there where you need to have the, a new computer like don't get me wrong but there are a lot of things where you know maybe a new computer isn't needed and you could use a re refurbished or a used computer and get the same the same value out of it and it's economically it's a more it's more affordable you know you can buy a computer that's three or four years old at you know over half the price of a new computer and unless you're again unless you're doing some of these specialized tasks the difference that the that the that the general user will notice is I mean, right away, you probably won't notice much, you know, it'll only be like three or four years in where like the new computer might not have slowed down as much, but the older one might have slowed down a bit. But even then, it's not, it's not as much as you think, at least from my experience, but like, what would you say that it's the biggest difference between a refurbished uh, computer versus a new computer? We could spend, we could spend a while. <laughs> um, well, like there are like, I don't mm. honestly like it, it, there is something to to new parts right like uh, when you get something that's used it just means that it's, it's had a little bit more wear and tear and you'll have to like be more mindful of the the, the what's happening inside like you know wine for it be careful you know checking to see if it's getting too hot or something like that or making sure you don't hear any weird noises you can hear weird noises with new computers but with the refresh one it's just that it's had that much longer of a life a lifespan to kind of have that become an issue um 
but you know what it ends up being is that like it's really about like what are you trying to do with your computer so like the example i always give is if somebody's trying to edit for a uh, video that's in 4k using a five-year-old computer laptop or something like that it's gonna be it, it's they're just they weren't built for that so their capacity to be able to do it properly is the, you can do it but you're gonna you're gonna notice the slowness of it whereas if you're having a new computer that's been optimized and set up to actually have that as part of its features, it, it's better for that. Um, and then similarly, same yeah. thing with people who do de like development and stuff like that. It will be, uh, the relation, it will be actually more link about the technology we were having time ago, uh, some time ago, or years before, rather than just uh, like, I don't know, I'm thinking about, um, I always get uh, second-hand uh, cell phones, and it's normally mm -hmm. because I'm. Uh, it's a herit heritage, you no, know, and inherit <laughs> uh, by my husband's uh, cell phone. I, I don't. I, I really don't uh, care about the model. Uh, so yeah. I, um, yeah. No. 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 I, I'm sorry. I'm talking about. I'm talking about computers. Like phones are the same thing. Although phones have an expiry date in them, because of. Um, yeah, like there's a certain point where when the when the the companies stop off providing security updates or support and stuff like that, you're running your phone continues to run run and take calls and stuff like that, but you're not your the security around it is not as much. And so when you hear some of these big like you know kind of like the exploits that they find out about that are traced back to hardware or software, if your if your device is no longer being supported, um, you're vulnerable to that, and that means you might not even be aware of it. So that's why like um, Earlier this year, uh, Microsoft ended support for Windows 7, right? And so, if you're running a computer with Windows 7, you, you're no longer getting those background security updates or anything like that. And so, Windows 7 is technically like it's it, it's an insecure operating system because nobody's watching it for any huge bugs. And so, if a bug pops up and somebody a bad actor finds it, you're kind of you're kind of you can be in a little bit you could be in a little bit of trouble. That's why open source is. Wow, well, I didn't know that. Yep. yep. Oh, wait, sorry. What does that have to do with open source? Well, so open source projects have longer life lifespans, and they also have like community support, and so that means they can last longer. Okay. Uh, and then, and you don't have this artificial barrier. It's also like, especially with computers, like if you're looking at like a, a, a an open source operating system, um, there's no fees associated with it. So if you do have to upgrade your operating system every five years. Um, you're not having to pay for a new license to get a new operating system. You can just mm. save your data, upgrade your operating system, and suddenly you've got a new lease on your computer with this new operating system. That's so nice. That's like the weaselation of the tech community. It's just like sharing everything for free. <laughs> well, like if you look at if you look at open source projects, that's that's their whole goal. Like free, like the the philosophy behind behind a free and open source software and, and free and open source project is that somebody creates something they put the code out there for everyone to look at and then if you want to make a modification and change it the only rule about it is that your software you make has to also be available for everybody else and so then people can build on other people's work and kind of pull out and then and kind of like you know create like a, an ecosystem of a, a system that works um and it's it's, it's wonderful that's so cool yeah. i was uh, listening the other day to the person that created the world internet <laughs> yeah www yeah. um and he was saying uh that the impact of having it accessible to everyone uh was like yeah. open product open protocols are what make the internet the internet possible it's because yeah. you don't need to know you don't need to have the same things everyone's speaking the same language and this language is open to everybody to modify and update and, and build upon so that we can have things like all the software and technology that we have it's based on an open protocol and then if you pull pull that back a little bit so like um one of the most popular um operating systems that that runs on this free and open source model is is uh is based on something that's called the, the linux kernel so linux so it's usually called a linux distribution but it's technically like a linux gnu or gnu um operating system and so the linux kernel the kernel is that piece of software that talks to the hardware and the software and so because that piece of code is free, that means everyone else can build their software on top of it using whatever hardware exists. And so they keep building out this kernel that kind of lets each other talk. And so people build 
uh, free and open source software on top of it that lets it kind of build out. And then suddenly you have a, comp you have a modern operating system that's running and working and, you know, um, in most things in the world now. Um, I have a, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. I just have a question about, um, that made me think like, does that, that must make companies like Microsoft angry. <laughs> And right, like, do they 20 years ago? Yes, that would have been the case. No. Okay, now they embrace it because oh, Linux servers run most of the internet, and oh. Microsoft is in a is like uh, it's like Amazon with their web storage, they have Azure, which is a web software. So they want people, they want to be friends with Linux, they want people, they've just they've just spent like their last two announcements, they've put this thing where they've got the Linux subset for Windows where you can do like command line stuff. On your on your windows computer that will be able to run connect to a linux server and stuff like oh. that it's a huge it's a it's a big thing you know and we don't want to get overly excited about it but you know ibm bought one of the biggest open source companies out there red hat for like billions of dollars because they know that there's the uh, the, the enterprise customers for this want that long-term support that can be customized to what they need it to do without okay. having to like you know so um so they don't want to change it. They don't want to change. Like, that's what I'd be worried that they're just going to like, nom, 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 take it all over. Well, the, the thing is, is that there, it's true that there are, right. there's always that, there's always that worry that some, that, that, that things will get gobbled up. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you don't like what's happening before the point where they say, no, 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 you just fork it. And then everything before that is free and you just make your own. And then this, the proprietary one continues on its own track. Okay. Right. After, to a certain point, like, this is all licensing things. And again, if there's a copyright lawyer who's out there who wants to really kind of get in, talk to me about like <laughs> my misunderstanding of things, I'm grossly, I'm obviously oversimplifying it. But the idea here is that that's the, that's the resilience of like a, of an open source project is that because the code is available uh, and specifically a free and open source. And so the free is in freedom, right? Like that's why the free geek is free is in freedom. It's not free as in no money. Um, it's the it's a software free it's this idea of having software freedom of being able to do what you want with your computers and you're not tied into what a company tells you you can do with your computer you can do whatever you want with it up to and including writing a code that will blow it up you know that's your choice and it's not a good choice it's not a good choice in some people's minds but it is it's it's an, it's an ability to have that to be able to kind of go into it and so um, you know and there's it, a lot to it yeah. it reminds me a lot about sustainability and um, I don't know, it's, a, it's about this uh, misconception of competition because it's like, oh, we, it, the world is um, like we have a scarce uh, resources, uh, money and capital, yeah. we should protect it. Yeah. And in, uh, I don't know, like I'm, I'm just thinking about sustainability and in sustainability, having competitors yeah. means that we are having a bigger impact it, it means that we are yeah. uh, creating more solutions for people. Yeah. So yeah. No, you're you're totally right. And, and about the sustainability, the reason why Free Geek uses you know Linux in, in so many things is because Linux runs lighter on resources, meaning that it runs better on older computers, computers that might not be able to run uh, the most modern you know proprietary operating system can run Linux no problem. Um, there are, and so I'm, I'm really being positive about this. Like, this is like, it's, it's, it's so, it's so phenomenal. There's, it's great, but we're talking, going back to that question about like, you know, that worry about like actually dealing with hardware. Um, it is, it's like people trying to move from, if people are at Mac people and then they try to move to windows or windows people try to move to Mac, it's the same issue. If you try and then move into like a Linux operating system. And the thing is, is that because everyone can fork their own, there are like, I think, I think at last count there were like 500 active operating systems in development and they all do slightly different things like there's a whole website dedicated to like just monitoring these things there are some that are more popular because they have like you know corporate backing and stuff like that that can kind of get you know they have stability and they're built for like long longer term stuff but you know that's that's the greatness is that you have a wide variety but then you're not if you don't pick the right one you might end the one where if the developer stops developing it then you're kind of in trouble so it's kind of that fashion. And then it is true, you are learning new software. And the big, the big, um, the big challenge with it is that a lot of for, uh, for pay, like software, proprietary software, doesn't run on Linux. Zoom does. 
um, a lot of the web web chatting features do, um, but your your Microsoft Offices, your uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, your AutoCAD, you know these are these are softwares that are very specific to industries, but also are very important everywhere. They don't run on Linux um, because they don't they haven't the Microsoft has no like if you think about Office, why would they build a Linux version of it for one, it's a 2% user base in the world. So you're building something for a very small group of people. But also, you know, like if you want people in your ecosystem, you want them in your Windows system. So there's not as much. There are open source alternatives that work well and do the same thing. But again, you're talking about how much time do people have? Do you want to learn a new software to kind of do the same thing you could do in Word where it's about the same, but not exactly. It, I, I always try to remind people, it's like when you first start using like Google Docs or something like that. If you're used to using Word, there are just slight things that are just a little bit different, just a little bit that just might throw off your workplace and you have to kind of like rearrange yourself too. Or if you're moving from Word to uh, Pages in, um, in, in Mac OS. And again, same, but there are small things that if you want to try and figure it, it can be immensely frustrating. And so I empathize with people who don't want to make that change because they just want to, you know, kind of stay as simple as they possibly can. But I, so I agree with that in, in certain work environments, you may not want to do this, but for a second computer for Netflix, I mean, you got Firefox, you got Chrome, you don't really, you don't use it much else. Does it matter what operating system it is underneath it? I, 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 again, people, could, people have to make their own decisions. That's the great thing about this. You got the freedom to choose what you want, but be knowing that this, that this, this alternative exists, one that can make your computers run longer and a little bit better you know if you have if you are so inclined and you so it, it kind of tickles your fancy maybe it's something to investigate maybe it's like again okay. it's that afternoon process and the the really great thing about it is if you do try and look into it you can download and run a linux operating system off a usb stick so if you just want to test it you plug it in you can test it see what it looks like and be like yes or no and then if not you just hit turn off unplug hit the power button and your regular computer comes back up again if yeah. you don't do anything silly, right? Like, but like, you know, just broadly, like, you know, that's what you can do. You know? I have a question about switching operating systems. So if someone did want to, like, they tested it out and they want to switch, do you have, like, does it erase all of your data when you switch operating systems? Yeah. I mean, you can do something called dual boot, but it's like very, it's an extra level of complication that if you're doing it for the first time, uh, it's really easy to like kind of break both. So um, generally what I say is that if you're going to look at installing an operating system, it's a good, um, it's good to do on an older computer. Maybe it's not your main work computer. It's like any. It's like I run um, hardware workshops for youth sometimes, and I always tell them if you're going to take apart a computer, get your old parents' old computer or your grandparents' old computer. Don't pick the family computer because if you break it, the likelihood of you breaking it is very high, and you don't want to break your your regular machine. So, you know, um, that's where like that's where like you can like you should explore, you can explore. Like if you've got an old computer that's probably gonna, that might not work anymore, but you wanna keep it around, what's the harm in, in, in trying something out? If you, again, if you have the time, which a lot of, some people do, if they are, if they're isolated right now, other people don't, it might be worth it. You know, if, if you're so inclined, it's, there's, there's the, the risk, if you, you know, spend some time looking into it and researching, the risk can be very, can be minimal, but you know, it's not, it's not nothing. But, yeah. Yep. I, I have a question. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, one is I have I have one of those laptops that's like it's that it's probably about ten years old, and we only watch stuff on it. That's all we use it for. But quite often, the blue screen of death comes up, and we're like, oh no. <laughs> I, it sounds like maybe that that would be an ideal situation to see yeah. if, yeah. Yeah, because, okay, now let's see if I can do this. Okay, this is gonna be the fun part. I'm gonna try and share my screen and I'm gonna show you something in Linux that's pretty cool. Oh, nope, the host has disabled screen share. Oh, I'm not in the... Oh, you're not, okay. Let's, let's I'm, see. I fix it. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, let's do desktop. Okay, I'm gonna close this. All right. Oh, nice so, picture. Everyone see my my nice desktop here? Oh, is it Rocky Mountains? I 
I don't know. It's just it's a default uh. thing on there. So this <laughs> this is this is what this is Linux Mint. Okay. So this is I'm running uh, an open source oh. operating system right now, running Zoom. Oh wow. Mint. Okay. And the first thing I want you to notice is that it doesn't look that different, right? In the bottom left hand corner, you have your start menu. And the the icons are different, but the uh, icons are different, yeah. but they're in the same places. And you yes. can kind of you can kind of guess by like names. Like over here, you have you know. I thought it was actually Microsoft, like uh, Microsoft software, like. <laughs> Well, that's the, the goal here is this one, this what reason. So this is the operating system that we install in FreeGeek because it does look so similar to um, other operating systems people might be coming from that they're able to kind of like navigate it with a little bit more simplicity. I don't do it, but usually we put all of the icons. So like your, your music software, your browsers and everything are on the desktop. I, that's my personal preference is not to have a lot of icons on it. That's just me, I like to see the nice picture, but um, but yeah. So you got something like this in Linux, where I have something here, which is lets me see like, hey, this is my op, this is my hard drive, and I've got something called like smart features, and I can see what's going on with it, and it tells me here this has been on for two years, that's the temperature, and looks like overall the disk is okay, and that's great. That's what I need to know about the hard drive. So. If you're getting the blue screen of death, you might want to check the hard drive to see if it's failing or dying. Wait a second. Sorry, the computer's been on for two years. I, no. No, the 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 hard drive has been powered oh. on for two years because it's I, was a, like, I was like, hey, that's not what you said. <laughs> no, no, it just it's every time it's on, it records it. So this 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 hard oh, drive might be might be four years old, but it was only ever on for for five, for for two of those years. <laughs> powered on for two um if you think and if you think about that that makes sense right like if you have you know if you're only using it you know five hours a day you know over a course of five days or something like that um if it's a business computer but yeah um and then you get so you get all the, you have all of your neat little things you can see here i have slack on here so i have if you need that for work uh i have this libre office that's the open source one which does exist for um for windows um so if you don't want to pay for microsoft office you could use LibreOffice. That's very interesting. Yeah. That you sounds have, amazing. You have your old uh, VLC player, which plays, you know, almost any media thing for uh, no oh demand. My gosh. Again, VLC cross Ryan, platform available for Windows as well. Ryan, uh, can you share with us a list of open sources uh, softwares um, that are like part of your top five or? Sure. I mean, uh, like, then, basically, so we you're, share it with uh, the viewers. Yeah, you're top, the top five. Like, if you're looking for you, the ones that are cross platform that you can use on, I'm going to stop sharing right now. Um, the top five, like, are if you want a web browser, Firefox. If you want a productivity suite, LibreOffice. If you want um, something to play your, your, your media files, VLC. Um, if you want, um, if you need to edit photos, there's the horribly named GIMP, G-I-M-P. Yeah, Graphic Image Manipulation Program. Oh. Yeah. What about uh, graphics, like a kind of an illustrator thing? <sighs> what is the illustrator? There is one. Uh, hold on, I have to look. I have to look. I don't know it off the top of my head. There is one. <laughs> there's like basically there for everything. There is something the the like there's a um there's something called caden live if you need to do video editing um but it only works it works really well in linux and the other platforms it's it works but it's you know they they haven't the stability issues they're still kind of sorting out at least last time i tried to use it um there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things uh oh, that's a new world for me i'm very happy to to learn it <laughs> inkscape is the vector based drawing it's called inkscape uh, if you need to do three, 3D rendering, there's a, a software called Blender, which is actually becoming, uh, with uh, the video games, it's becoming more and more the standard, um, the Blender, because it's so, it's, they can, they, because you can customize it and you can play around with it, uh, VFX companies are starting to like it more and more because they can, they can make their own, they can add their own flavors to it and stuff like that. Um, yeah, like, I don't know, I could go through like a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, let's see what else is here. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. And 
some company like some companies like the, so then there are and like i said like not all things kind of are cross platform like are available on linux but you know like uh at free geek you know we use slack a lot and so that there's a there's a linux um app for that um microsoft released a skype for linux so if you're using skype there's a whatsapp uh available for linux um so you know like so there are some of these things that do exist it's just not everything across the board so it's like it, it really depends on what you're what you're yeah. working on but like Operating you know system. at free geek we we run our the entire operation using um google drive and LibreOffice. you know i only have microsoft office because uh sometimes i get forms that i can't fill out in other ways and i have to use it you know um yeah <laughs> can i ask you the sorry the other question that i had is that okay <laughs> Um, because I think, um, well, we had someone ask, I think maybe it was Lynn or maybe it was Tony. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but about cleaning, I don't know if I missed, I missed some of the beginnings. So I'm not yeah. sure if you mentioned, I know you did kind of go into it, but did you mention like how often should we be either cleaning it ourselves or getting it cleaned? Um, and are there kind of uh, like almost like a toolkit that you would recommend for people to get if they are going to do it themselves. Oh, that's a good question. Um, the often, how often you do it? I mean, you do it when you notice that it needs to be done. Like, because okay. the because the more times you open it up, the more likely you are to to break something. Like, I don't open up my computers if I don't have to. It's like you're just you're it, it, the amount like especially with laptops. There are uh, when you're trying to get things off there are these little clips that you have to use a, like a pry tool to get out. And the amount of times you can just snap one off if you're not careful. And so you probably want to do it like, so that's why I'm trying to, we were talking about the maintenance before of like trying to avoid having to get to that point where you have to clean it. Okay. Um, lifting desktops off the ground is really helpful. Like not having it on the floor. Oh yeah. Um, Cause the amount of dirt that gets in that way is, is really good. But so there, there's, there's a school of thought that like, if you want to talk about like your software, you should be like refreshing or reinstalling all your all your operating system every two to three years. Ugh. I don't recommend doing that because it's just again it's one of these things where you it's you're inviting losing not forgetting to back something up and losing data and stuff like that. But if you do refresh it that way, you, you, it gets rid of all the junk and the clutter, and it's like it's you know you get like a new it's like you know you're starting from zero, so it, it reclutters up again eventually. But you know that you sounds nice. Something. I know it's it, rid of the club, like. <laughs> there are programs like if you're using windows and stuff like that there are some programs that will get rid of clutter and stuff like that like a cc cleaner and stuff like that but again you have to be careful with that because they'll ask you hey do you want to delete these and like you were saying before with the uh with the operations and the task manager you're not sure what it is if you say yes to it and it's something that was important for some reason that the computer the program couldn't acknowledge you could be out of luck okay um in terms of uh, if you want to invest in tools, um, I would recommend going with uh, the, the company iFixit for two reasons. One, their stuff's pretty good, but two, they are huge into the re to repair movement in the U.S. Like they are big, like that's their that's one of their big things that they do, and they create a lot of um, uh, like dismantling guides and stuff like that on their website and like videos and stuff like that, and so. Um, it's they're they're kind of pushing for more, um, you know, the right to repair around the idea of you know releasing manuals and guides to like this to be able to fix your own things, but also the parts needed to fix it. That's the big thing is that if you can't fix something, if you can't get the part for it, that's it, right? Like, um, and so they're they're kind of the thing. So their their tools are 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 well are well made. Like, I mean. I have a couple of them and we have a couple of them at the office at the, at the store and they're fine, but we also use like, you know, we've bought other ones like, you know, from other shops and stuff like that in the city and things like that, that were like, not as, not as expensive and they work fine. You know, they, the thing, the thing is it, with, um, with any type of, uh, with any type of tool here, it's like, I've got this thing, right? This is the thing I take with, I don't have all of my tools with me, but this little thing here, this is my screwdriver. It looks like a pen. And in it, I have, okay, I can't get them all out. I have a, I have like a bunch of tool heads, right? That I can use to kind of fix things. And 
uh, let's see this one. Mm, that might be too hard. This one's like a five star thing. And on, on the, the, the cheaper the thing is, the, the, the weaker the metal is. And so when you stick this in and try and turn it, it might wear down quicker. And so you might not get as many uses out of it. Whereas you buy high, uh, the higher quality ones, they last a little bit longer because they're made of a stronger metal. metal. Um, and they won't. Yeah, the rest of them are stuck in there right now. Tell Hoffman uses them, but it, it's perfect because it has all the screws that I would need to basically take apart most laptops. In it. And it's just kind of like something that I can just throw in my bag and I have it with it. I have a USB stick with a Linux Live boot on it, so if I have to diagnose something, I have that as well. You know, it's just kind of like you have like I, I don't know everything, but I can you know do little things like that, like. Your green blue screen of death you know if i just plug it in and it, it works fine then i'm like well maybe it's the hard drive or maybe it's the the display right and you can kind of kind of start diagnose that diagnosing things there um but yeah well <laughs> thank you cool i think we uh, are arriving to the fun funny part okay <laughs> can i ask one more quick question before oh, we go? yes of course we do <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of computer like computer security okay yeah I don't think I even have like, I don't even know what they're called, firewall virus, antivirus things. Like how important are those? <laughs> or like, is there something that you would say like, is like definitely do this to keep your computer safe? Yeah, um, a firewall and an antivirus, especially if you're running a Windows or a Mac machine are really important. Good news is if you're running Windows 10, it comes with those things already installed and, they're, they're, and as soon as you turn them on, unless you turn it off, they're already running in the background. Um, there's Windows Defender if for Windows. The Mac one, they have, you can get a firewall on it, but you have to download an antivirus. They don't have like an antivirus in, in, involved with it. Um, for, so if you have Windows Defender, you don't need anything else? I mean, you can get something else, right? Like Windows Defender, like if you look at all the research, like Windows Defender, it's it's free, right? So any, all the free, so all the free options for antiviruses and stuff like that are all about the same level of goodness. Like, you know, there are, there are varying ones where they might be better at other things and other things, but um, broadly, they're all they're all there's very little difference between between them. Um, I know again, there'll be people who will say, "Oh no, there's a vast difference," especially where the company is. Like, you know, if you want your antivirus company to be in the U.S. based or European based or something like that, right? But you know, I mean, if you've already got a Windows operating system or a Mac operating system, if you take their thing, like it's they have a vest, like, let's put it this way. Window, Microsoft has a vested interest in their antivirus software that comes with their operating system being good because if it's not good and people get tons of viruses, that's bad for them, right? So like, I mean, it's not the best reasoning, but it's, you know, like it's self-preservation on their part. What um, about uh, Mac? Because uh, I remember yeah. like so many years ago, it was like almost impossible to get a virus, but it's not that's not the case oh, anymore. You God. should get an antivirus for your Mac. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's again. It's the popular. Think about this. It's the popularity of iOS, right? iOS is directly tied into and associated with Mac, Mac OS, and they're they're slowly starting to merge them together more and more. And so, if there are vulnerabilities in iOS and there's vulnerabilities in Mac OS, you need to kind of save yourself. And so. Um, it might not be as necessary as Windows because, again, Windows is the dominant force in computing. So, if I'm a bad actor and I want to create a virus, I'm going to pick it. I'm going to try and get the most people as possible, right? So I'm going to go after Windows. Linux has two percent. So, are there viruses out there? Yes, there are malware and everything for everything, but there's not nearly as much. And the way that Linux is set up uh, specifically to be permission-based and secure, so you can't just automatically do something. So, you know, why, why people create virus? <laughs> I don't know. Some, like, you know I, 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 um, so a virus. Well, you know what? Isn't it? You, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, isn't it just to like steal your data or like try to get some sort of access to, I don't know, there's something? A, there's a variety. Yeah. There's a variety of different reasons why you would do it, right? Like, so one of them does like, there's like crypto miners who are basically just using your, your unused resources to mine Bitcoin so they can make money off of it that way. Um, there's ransomware where they basically lock up your computer and then ask you to pay money to get that thing. So that's how they make money that way. There's, um, there's key loggers, which are 
you know, they'll, they'll log all your keystrokes so they can get your password and then steal your money and stuff like that. Um, there's identity fraud that way, you know, like kind of that can go that way that, that you know, they're basically trying to like ha hack you there. But, you know, what's become much more possible, it's not, they're not going after the, the software anymore. It's they're going after the users. That's why don't repeat, don't repeat your passwords is the most important thing you can ever Oops. do. <laughs> no, it's like, it, it's, it's so important because if you, if the amount of times uh, a data set gets breached, cause like, think about it, you could be as secure as you want to, but if you're using an online service and, and they only have a, one, one password they have everywhere. One, <laughs> yeah. They have one breach and they have your, they have your uh, email address and they have your password. They can then go to a bunch of different, different sites and see if those work. And then they know which ones don't work and which do work. And then if uh, the other data, like your security questions kind of got lost in that data breach as well, then they know that and they could try and like, you know, re re redo it that way. So yeah, you need to be, <laughs> you need to be kind of mindful. Um, I, I don't, I don't say this lightly, but like, there's two things you can do. Uh, one, you can use a, uh, um, a password, uh, generator, generator. Like, some, like keys pass and stuff like that, which is like, it locks down it and you have one master password that then it kind of generates all these random ones for all the sites Aww. you go. You can use that. Or so long as you don't put a sticky note or a piece of tape with all the passwords on your computer, if you have a piece of paper that you've written down and then you hide it in your house so that nobody can find it and you don't put the email associated with it, I mean, that's secure too. We, right? we are so uh, predictable, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that um, a lot of, if you lose access to your heart, if someone gets access to your computer and they want to get access and they want to get all this information from you, if, if they have your, if they physically have your computer. I have to say that if someone gets access to my computer, there is nothing in my computer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can do things like you can encrypt the drive and stuff like that and then and things like that. But that's, you gotta do that at the beginning, right? But um, that's why phones are okay. So, you know, your phone, like new modern mm -hmm. phones, what they do is when they set it up, it's in, they already encrypt the drive. And so, you know, like if you do that iPhone thing where if it's 10 times and it, you put that feature on where if you type in the password 10 times, it wipes it. Well, what it does is it, does, it doesn't actually wipe it. It just loses the encryption key. So all the data is still there, but it's encrypted in this way that... Um, I don't know what encryption they use, but it's like one of these things where it's basic, it would take like thousands of years for them to unencrypt it. So the only people who could do it would be uh, governmental actors, not, you know, criminals and stuff like that. And so, so like, I guess government it's I not know. good to save my password also. <laughs> I, I don't, again, we don't want to go down this, I don't want to go too much further down this, but yes. if the government want, if the government wants to, there's nothing you can do. If the government that, there's nothing you can do. I'm sorry. I, I there, the amount of things that you'd have to go through to jump through to kind of like do it. But if the, yeah, it's, yeah, sorry. I, I, I mean, there will be people who will say, oh no, there are steps you can take to, 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 to derail it. And that's totally true. Yes, that is entirely possible. But if you are just an everyday user and that's it, like, I mean, hi FBI, you know, that's like all of us. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. Like, like, again, these things are so highly unlikely. Like I say, like if you take the proper precautions and stuff like that, don't reuse your, your passwords. Uh, don't give out your passwords to people. Um, you know, um, enable things like on your, uh, on your devices, like the find my iPhone or anything like that. Do that because like when they do that, you, it's, it's really hard to kind of get back into it. And again, it's, you know, it's, it ends up being people like they have to weigh how much time they want to spend doing it. Right. And again, I would, if you really are this, I would recommend kind of looking up on, on, on more security issues because there are lots of people who can talk a lot more about kind of like the whole infrastructure of it. Like I was being a little flippant there about the, about the, the government thing. I was just true, but it's also you don't really like, <laughs> don't, don't, you don't know. stress ourselves. Yeah, don't stress yourself. <laughs> like, I mean, like, it's not like there's we so many. There's so many like, get a little bit paranoid, but it's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> well, it's like the thing. Like, if you, it's like you know, if you got your phone, turn it on airplane mode when you're walking around, so that you know you're not pinging off and telling people where you are. Like that, right? like, to be honest, now uh, because of coronavirus, I'm not taking out my cell phone with me. Yep. And it's very refreshing. It's nice. Just not being worried about. Uh, technology and just enjoying 
I haven't got I haven't gotten to that point yet because I still like to listen to like podcasts when I'm walking around. <laughs> yeah. And so I ha- and I don't and I don't have like two devices anymore. Everything's one device. So the way I get around that is airplane mode. I can't check my I can't check the internet. I can't get calls. I just I can just listen to what's on the device and it's great. I love it. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. okay. Pam 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 pam. Funny questions. Sure. <laughs> Funny part of them. What do you prefer, beach or mountains? Mountains. Uh, tea or coffee? Oh, tea, tea, coffee, uh-huh. bad. <laughs> what type of tea do you prefer? Uh, first thing in the morning, I like a nice Earl, uh, Earl Grey. Um, later in the day, I'll maybe switch to a green tea. And then at night, it's a nice, like, uh, I got this thing that's like a or chamomiles, and it's like all these different types of chamomiles in one thing. It's very, it's a very nice way to go to sleep. I think. <laughs> uh, what about your thumb? Is it green or not? Is my thumb? Oh no, no. no my thumb's <laughs> black from like touching technology all the time. No, but oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, you know, no, I don't, I don't garden. I don't, I don't garden. No. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to make, yeah, no, I don't garden. However, the rest of my family does. My my uh, my father and my sister are are huge gardeners, huge. Mm-hmm. So much of the discussion we have family conference calls is around them telling us what they've been planting. So, and even though you have a black thumb, do you have a favorite plant? Mm, I guess it's this one right here because it's right beside me. I don't, oh. I think this, I don't know what uh, this is. Pilia, Pilia, right? I think. Sure. I don't know if I'm saying it right. P I L E A. I don't know. I don't know how I pulled that out. <laughs> it, hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't died. So um, it's my favorite, I guess. <laughs> I think I got a fern over there too, but you know. Um, where would you take your next holidays if we can? <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know. I. Um, my last holiday, I went to the West Coast. So I was in Vancouver and Portland, um, which was very nice. I also got to see the free geeks in Vancouver and Portland, which was also oh. very nice. Yeah. So if you're in Vancouver or Portland, go to the free geeks there. They're very nice people. <laughs> so are the ones in Chicago and in Arkansas. They're also very nice as well. <laughs> and Minneapolis. There, or, oh. Uh, you you were mentioning that there are a lot of free gigs. So. Yeah, yeah. So the original one was in Portland, and then so then like any good open source project, people took the idea and then made it for their own locales. And so I think the next one was Vancouver. And so the ones that have, have been around for a while, they're in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, Chicago, Illinois, Lafayetteville, Arkansas, um, and there's one in Pennsylvania. Huh. And there was one in Detroit but it's not there anymore. And there was, and there were, so there's been a couple that have kind of popped up, existed for a while and then had to shut down. Like there was one in Rhode Island for a while too, which was really nice, but they, unfortunately, it, it's hard to keep going because, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not, it's a challenge, right? You know, like if, you know, what you have like a couple of key yes. people leave, it's- You rely you know, on volunteers and yes. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, so, yeah. I have another one. Go ahead. Um, if you could change your first name, what would it be? I've never thought about changing my name. <laughs> I've, like, I've really, I've never, I've never thought about it. Um, uh, yeah, I've never, I've never thought about it. Um, would you choose the same one? I, I mean, I guess so, because I hadn't I thought about it. Like, I, I've been around. I had a years ago i had a teacher tell me that um ryan's are always trouble um, in, in school and stuff and actually they said ryan's and zach's and my best friend's name was zach at the time and so i was like that's weird and we weren't in their classroom it was just a kind of an offhand comment I was like, that's, that's very strange but very supportive teacher <laughs> well i wasn't a student anymore i was that was an adult and so i thought that was they didn't know my first name so i was like mm, that's a little weird but, oh. So yeah, uh, so it was very awkward when she said that. And, <laughs> yeah, so and my name's Ryan. <laughs> oh, that is actually literally what I did. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, oh. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Anyway. What about you, Sophie and Tony? Uh, I like 
my name. Yeah, I, I never, I don't think I ever thought about changing it either, actually. I feel like I did when I was a kid and now I can't even remember what I thought I might change it to. I quite <laughs> like my name. Yeah. I don't think I changed it either. <laughs> I think we, we define ourselves also by our names sometimes, no? Like, yeah. we feel like I, I feel like Erica. <laughs> yeah. uh, but when I was younger, I wanted to change it to April. Oh. It's nice. You yeah, look more nice. like an Erica to me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I have a last question for, for you, Ryan. Sure. What's the most beautiful place uh, on earth for you and why? Um, hmm. So, uh, I don't know. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think that's changed as, uh, as, as, as time's gone on. You know, like when I was a little kid, it would have been like um, the backyard at my at my grandparents' place because they had a small yard and then it backed into a, uh, a park with a giant hill. So in the winter we would go mm -hmm. tobogganing down and stuff like that, and that was you know a lot of a lot of good memories um, come from that. Um, and then you know as I got older, you know, um, like I liked my first apartment even though it was a dump, but you know kind of what it represented at the time and stuff like that. And then now. You know, like every time I every time I'm able to go someplace new and different and see something like I hadn't seen before, um, it's just always exciting. Like, you know, there was a oh, and I was in I was in Portland this summer. They have these things where they have these these food trucks. No, they're not food trucks. They're like food stalls, and they're like usually in like in in, in abandoned uh, the reclaimed like parking lots and stuff like that. Oh and so you can God. go into them, and there's all these different like different types of food vendors going on, and it's really interesting. And it, like. And I went to one that was really busy and exciting. And it was just kind of like, it was just a neat, it was just a neat different thing that I hadn't seen before. I even I love the part that it was a reclaim uh, place. I think it was, I mean, it was an industrial area and there was like nothing mm -hmm. else around it, but it was just like this, like, it looked like an old uh, like parking lot, but it, it was, yeah. it had, it was very good food. You know? It made me remember uh, this amazing place in Amsterdam um, that was an, uh, a school um, a school before some years ago uh, but it was like an abandoned school so mm -hmm. some people took it over and now is uh, uh, they they have uh, several art uh, exhibitions and mm -hmm. also they are running a, a kitchen vegan kitchen mm -hmm. uh, that is run by volunteers and it's like very powerful that is being run by uh, community people and everyone is being fed in there. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of neat things that happen when, yeah. when people can change it. Um, I used to work at a bookstore that sold like social justice and one of my favorite books was, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of it, but it was a, just a, it was a series of short stories all about people telling stories about the different plots in the community garden and the people who mend them. And it was a young adult novel. And it was just, it was beautiful because it was just like it, the centering piece was this community garden and all the things that happened that people bring in their different pieces to it. It was really nice. It's called Seeds of Something. I can't remember. Mm. I went looking for my bookshelf. When it there. comes to your mind, send it over. <laughs> it's a very nice, it was a very nice book. It was very thin, very, but very, very moving, even reading it like, you know, well after I, you know, was not a young adult. <laughs> Do you guys want to ask something? No, but I will say hello, just because I didn't yes. actually <laughs> see well at the beginning. So it's nice to see all your faces. Ryan, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I caught the end and uh, yeah, I need to work on my passport, password game. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I mean, I there, you can the look up. The weekend. <laughs> yeah, you can look up like people have like a different ways of of doing it. Like there's things like where you can like pick the same like random set of numbers and letters at the beginning and then you just change the middle and stuff like that. So it's still kind of randomized. So they can't brute force attack it where they just kind of do all the dictionary words and stuff like that. But if anyone figures out your pattern, then they've also got <laughs> access to it that way, right? So there's no there's no hundred percent solution, right? You just gotta. It's all about mitigating risk. So I would say. 
even if you just change it, like if it's like, you know, the same word, but you change the number for each one, that's something, you know, <laughs> at but, least, <laughs> yeah. but I don't know, like, you know, there, that, that could be that like doing that, that could be a whole talk in and of itself, right? Like just, just <laughs> be secure online. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, thank you. It was super cool to learn uh, technology, uh, about the technology world. <laughs> My pleasure. And um, so we do a giveaway uh, every episode. Uh, you can tag me to the Zero Waste Cafe at Zero Waste, uh, Zero Waste Cafe and uh, post something that uh, you discovered tonight and that you are looking to discover a bit more, you, are, you want to learn more about it and uh, you will enter to a raffle <laughs> and uh, we will send you a nice note and some seed paper uh, so you can also have some nice plants even if your thumb is black as ryan <laughs> i feel like that might not been the right metaphor to go with but yeah <laughs> mine is black also ryan don't worry <laughs> Uh, but well, thank you very much, Ryan from uh, Free Geek Toronto. Thank you very much, your eco friend Sophie, Tony and Lynn from uh, uh, Plastic Free Toronto, <laughs> and see you all uh, next Wednesday. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs>